NACDL is the Association of the Nation's Criminal Defense Bar. So in this part two, we're going to talk about written advocacy and oral advocacy. What goes into that brief and how do you argue effectively uh, before the appellate court. So just to kick things off, I just finished uh, a study with a colleague of mine who does a lot of statistical work on Eighth Circuit cases in 2016. And we tested a lot of this folk wisdom around what makes for a good brief. Fewer issues are better, shorter briefs are better, uh, fewer sentences and so forth. And what we found was there was very, very little if no correlation between this folk wisdom and the ultimate um, uh, success of an appeal. It's not to say it's worthless, but it's to say that, and I think we'll all agree with this, the underlying uh, goal is to be clear, it's to be organized, it's to be effective, it's to be convincing. And so uh, we'll talk a lot about how to draft a uh, how to draft an issue, how to draft the statement of facts, and so forth. And we're going to have some differences of opinion, uh, but I think ultimately we'll, we'll, we'll have a lot of agreement and where we have differences of opinion, that'll be, that'll be helpful. So a, a couple rules of thumb which I've just put up. Uh, first of all, this seems to make sense, but you need to know the facts, you need to know the law and your argument inside and out. Uh, whenever the judge at oral argument, whenever any judge at oral argument or your client asks you a question about your argument or the facts or the law, you need to have the right answer. Uh, and you need to sort of ultimately know it without thinking about it. You've just imbibed it and you know it. Uh, second, in the brief itself, you want to include all of the relevant facts, law and argument, and really not one word more. Uh, there's a lot of stuff in the uh, district court record that's frankly not relevant and you need to realize what that is and if it's not relevant you keep it out. Third, uh, be able to explain your reason for including each section, paragraph, sentence, word, and indeed white space in your brief. Uh, the brief contains your argument but it's also uh, persuasive in its aesthetics. Does it look like a convincing brief? And so if you're able to explain everything in that brief. If you're able to give a reason for doing what you did, that's probably going to be an effective brief. Yeah, I mean, just I, years ago when I did uh, my early in my career, <clears throat> I always wanted my briefs to be set in courier type because it would look like the brief, <clears throat> even when I was an early adopter of computers, it would look like that brief was produced on an IBM Selectric typewriter and those older judges on the Court of Appeals, it would make them think of the days in the law firm when that's what their work looked like and therefore would be convincing, not valid today. Right. But I started with Courier New because yeah. my former boss had it and I thought as soon as somebody looks at the, that brief in the Eighth Circuit, they'll know I wrote it. Uh, however, a, a couple studies came out in the past five or ten years suggesting that font with serifs are read at a little bit more of an efficient rate. So we're thinking Garamond, we're thinking Times New Roman. Uh, if you want to go with Courier New, feel free. Uh, but have a reason for going with the font that you do. And make sure that it's allowable by the rules in your jurisdiction. Uh, I know yes. in our jurisdiction, only certain font is acceptable. Right. That's yeah. There's a list of In the acceptable. U.S. Supreme Court, one font is acceptable. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, you know, even think about things like the font. Uh, so the, the, the fourth suggestion here, the fourth rule of thumb, perhaps should seem obvious, but I, I've seen a lot of attorneys not really do this. Edit, edit, edit. Um, you can write a first draft and it seems good, but if you go back, you'll probably see that a quarter of it, perhaps a third of it, you can cut out, or it's not clear, or you haven't uh, adequately uh, supported a statement. So it really pays to edit. I think I edit my briefs at least three times. Uh, I was going to say three or, four. three or four times. And yeah. this means starting the process early. So, so especially true. for attorneys who are trial attorneys and appellate attorneys, because trial deadlines are usually quick and that's mm -hmm. what you're thinking is what's next on your to-do list or calendar, but you really need to 
front load and put in the beginning time in the appeal so that you have the time mm -hmm. to go through the various edits. And if you're the kind of person who dictates a first draft, which of which there are some lawyers, right? Mm -hmm. Then especially you're going to mm -hmm. need that editing process. The advantage of being an appellate attorney is the work is a little more streamlined. It's a little more uh, predictable in terms of time, but you need to use that to produce a really perfect document. Trial attorneys' motions, they're not necessarily mm -hmm. perfect, and we understand that because you're under the gun. Mm -hmm. Not quite so much with exactly. appellate practice. Perfect is the goal, not the results, right? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, one thing to note at the outset regarding oral argument, we'll get to that at the end of this session, but um, I would say the vast majority of the time you would want to request an oral argument if you can. Different jurisdictions are going to differ. In the Eighth Circuit, you request it in your brief. In other circuits, they don't they don't want to hear about your request and they'll decide uh, in perhaps some states or other Or they areas. have some very different time and format for making that request. Sure. Also. Sure. Yeah. Um, in my career, I think I have not requested oral argument once. Um, so as a general rule of thumb, I request it and it's, it's usually pretty easy to meet, to meet the court's requirements. Um, so those are just the rules of thumb which we're going to unpack over the next hour. Uh, why don't we start with the table of contents. So every jurisdiction is going to have uh, pretty concrete rules regarding what needs to go into a brief. I, I would imagine every jurisdiction requires a table of contents. Mm -hmm. Maybe we should mention here that they'll be available to people that are watching this program some specific, some entire briefs mm -hmm. written by each of us, mm -hmm. right? One mm -hmm. or two from each of us in which you can see ways of implementing mm -hmm. each of these ideas. And you'll see that Catherine's look different from Stevens and Stevens mm -hmm. look different from mine, mm -hmm. but all of them will be consistent with what Steve is saying. Right, right. And, and as far as the brief that I submitted goes, I think it's a good example. It, there are certainly better briefs out there from other attorneys, but, but it's a good example. It's a template you can use. Catherine's brief, Peter's brief, they're great examples. So as far as the table of contents goes, uh, some attorneys have very sparse tables of contents. Uh, one section might be entitled law. That, that's about as sparse as you can get. Uh, my personal preference is you want to expand that out a bit. You want the judge to be able to look at the table of contents, read the table of contents, and get a really good picture for what your argument is, uh, what the relevant facts are, and then of course what the relief requested is. I'd be, I'd be tempted to put my foot down more strongly on that and say that every heading and subheading that appears in the brief should be reproduced in mm -hmm. the table of contents. And I, I really, I mean, there are many, many points that we're going to talk about mm -hmm. where it's a matter of preference and there are any number of ways to do mm -hmm. it well. But I'm, I'm going to say on table of contents, a table of contents that has a heading that says argument mm -hmm. or law, okay. and then the next one says conclusion is bad. I would um, and rarely am I going to be willing to say that. I would agree with you, absolutely. Open the cover. Absolutely. You know, the judge, that law clerk is going to, open the one, going to open the cover. Why not have the first thing in his or her face be the whole flow mm -hmm. and in effect a summary? I view it as an of, outline. It's like, right, absolutely. of your whole case. So on the, on the PowerPoint, there are three sort of uh, Goldilocks options for a table of contents I've given. The one that's unhelpful, there was insufficient evidence. Well, that, tell the that tells the judge and the clerk something, but not a whole lot. Uh, the one that's not too bad is that, well, there was no evidence of the type of shoe used in the assault. And this is from a case that uh, will be argued, that I'm arguing in the Eighth Circuit in June. Uh, the, the better uh, heading for, a tape, for, for inclusion in the table of contents is, the law requires evidence of the type of shoe used to prove assault with a deadly weapon. There was no such evidence. Therefore, there was insufficient evidence to find the appellate guilty. Now, when, when the you judge say table the court, of contents, you mean this is an argument heading, right? That's uh, that would be the argument heading, right? right. Okay. The judge, the clerk is going to read that. They're going to know exactly the law, the facts, and what I think the holding should be. Then they can proceed to the body of the brief to unpack that and to get the real substance. So I think, generally speaking. Uh, having sort of your full, although annotated and outlined, version of your argument in the table of contents yeah. is the best. So as an argument heading, and I, whether it's table of contents or not, but as an argument heading, 
I wouldn't write that last one. Mm -hmm. I don't think I would go beyond two sentences, and I'd be more inclined to see if I could write one coherent sentence that that conveyed or suggested each of those ideas. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. But I understand this is a this is a very modern, yes, and sleek style, which I don't happen to use. Yeah, but uh, it's very compelling. And in a minute, we'll talk about how to formulate an issue. And we'll we'll get to these differences of opinion. Yeah. Uh, the next section in the brief is typically going to be the table of authorities, all the cases and the statutes. If you're citing law reviews, uh, regulations, and quite simply, you want to include every single source cited. It might seem obvious, but I've seen a lot of briefs where that doesn't happen. It's worth learning the tricks of the word processor that you're using to take advantage of that automatic table generating feature that every word processor has now, even though it's a pain to learn. If you're Once you've learned it, you'll be so glad. <laughs> and I don't know if you all do this. I'm sure there's different ways, but I actually separate out the types of authority. So I'll have mm -hmm. a heading cases and list all the cases, another one statutes and rules, and then mm -hmm. law review journals. Um, I have... Sure. And so, sometimes even more than that. I mm -hmm. have U.S. Supreme Court, yeah. Eighth Circuit, other circuit courts of appeal, Ooh. U.S. District Courts. To go even further with wow. the cases. State I've never courts. done that, but that's interesting. Yeah, and yeah. and the rule of thumb, that's, that's not a requirement in the Eighth Circuit, but the rule of thumb is clarity, what's going to help the judge or the clerk see right. exactly where you're going. Yeah. And if... Yep. You know, you may be in a position to use that table of authorities as something you're referring to later in your reply brief, for example. It's like Absolutely. we cited five cases that the government didn't even mention in their responsive brief. Compare opening brief page little three <laughs> to with appellant, uh, Appellee's brief yeah. page little two. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Let's talk about the statement of the issues. Uh, it's a very important part of your brief. There's a, there's a lot of folk wisdom out there. One of the legal writing gurus, Brian Garner, says it shouldn't be over 75 words. And he says that there should be a major premise, a minor premise, and a conclusion. And that's um, typically that's the, the, the better uh, construct here. The law requires evidence of the type of shoe used to prove assault with a deadly weapon. That's the major premise. It's the law. In this case, there was no such evidence. That's the minor premise, the facts. And the conclusion, therefore, there was insufficient evidence to find the appellant guilty. So Brian Garner, who worked a lot with Justice Scalia on legal writing manuals and so forth, says this is the way to do it. But uh, in the study I did with my colleague, there's no correlation between uh, number of words cited in an issue uh, or, or that comprise an issue statement with outcome success. So as Catherine will say and as Peter will say, there are different ways of creating that issue statement. But I venture to say, you know, if when, when people look at the sample brief from Catherine, the sample brief from me, the sample brief from you, you will see that in the statement of each issue, these notions of a minor and major premise are included in the formulation even though they may not be laid out mm -hmm. in that ABC style. Absolutely. And know the, know the rules to or how your court views what an expected statement of issue should be. For example, we call them in Virginia assignments of error. Uh -huh, right. And I mm. suggest, I personally don't follow Gardner's rule, though certainly not one to argue with the wisdom of that. Mm -hmm. But I kind of view it as a Goldilocks approach where you don't want to have a statement of the issue or assignment of error too general. Because if it's too general, it might be deemed insufficient and not even establishing the jurisdiction of the court. However, when you give too much information, sometimes you begin to box yourself in. And if the argument isn't fully encompassed by the assignment of error, any argument that deviates from that assignment of error is going to be considered waived. So I suggest sometimes that you don't want to be too specific because you don't want to box yourself in unless if you're confident in your argument and the direction that it's completely right. going to go. So I try to find that middle ground mm -hmm. um, to balance the two sides. But that's also because I'm aware of the current culture of how the courts are viewing assignments of error. Whereas when I first started practicing, I definitely leaned towards the side of being more specific. Mm -hmm. But as case law interpreting what a sufficient assignment of error is has changed, I've kind of changed my practice with it. So I think that's where different jurisdictions come in. Some jurisdictions right have more stringent requirements for the statement of the issue. 
in the Eighth Circuit, uh, it's 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 relatively flexible. If you if you state the issue in the issue statement or in your argument, you have it and you preserve. But it. to underscore what Catherine said, this cannot be emphasized. This is both a matter of persuasiveness of style and a matter of preservation of issues. This is one of the places in a brief where the rules of the jurisdiction, as interpreted in the, in the case law of the jurisdiction, may tell you that the way something is stated and whether something is stated on the assignments of error mm -hmm. or the statement of issues is itself preclusive mm -hmm. of what is considered to be within the scope of that appeal. I view this as probably the most important part of the petition or the brief where if you're not perfect in the argument okay but this really sets the stage for everything to come. Maybe you should point out what you mean when you refer to a petition because there are states like Virginia where when we talk about an opening brief we're skipping a big step that's that's important to mention. Sure, and I think other states can be like this too. A client has a right to appeal and but you file a petition for appeal where you're asking the court to uh, grant you an appeal or award you an appeal. So you first need to get in the door in order for the court to file that opening brief and have the court actually consider it on the merits. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Federal habeas corpus jurisprudence, there is a similar, the, the same procedure, which is called certificate of appealability. Mm -hmm. Interesting point, uh, which I wasn't going to bring up, but it's a good point. On federal habeas appeal, the court essentially tells you what issue you can argue. Um, mm -hmm. Some of them are some of them are clearer, you know. Rather than uh, some of them are clearer, some of them are unclear. In fact, I have a motion right now pending to clarify the issue uh, that that the court set for me because it, it's a bit unclear. So uh, on the PowerPoint right now, you just have three uh, sort of versions of the appel uh, of the uh, statement of the issue. The one that um, I'm guessing we'd all agree with is relatively unhelpful. Is a very sparse one. The appellant's medical condition was extraordinary. It, it doesn't necessarily tell you much. Uh, the one that's not bad is the district court erred in finding that the appellant's medical condition was not extraordinary. It's more helpful because on appeal the issue isn't really whether his medical condition was extraordinary. It's whether the district court erred. Right. That's really the issue. The third issue, the, the, the better one as I call it, is the one that I'm actually arguing in, a, in a, an appeal I have right now. Uh, I'm, I'm guessing Peter is going to say this is too long. Uh, but what it does is it's got that major premise, it's got that minor premise, it's got the conclusion, and it sets forth very clearly for the, uh, for the appellate court that the district court judge really did find a lot of extraordinary extraordinarily uh, a serious medical condition on, on, on the part of my client and I want to make sure uh, up front in the issue that's stated because just like Catherine said the issue is what sets forth the appeal it's it's probably the most important it's the core of the of the brief and if you get that right everything grows from and that. And if your jurisdiction requires a summary of argument in the brief mm -hmm. which many do but not all then you may need less detail in your mm -hmm. statement of issue as long as you've covered the issue properly yes. because you're going to get to summarize that issue and some law clerks, some judges will say summary of argument is where they go first to see what the appeal is about after the table yeah. of contents. Some, some jurisdictions, I think, have a requirement that you include the standard of review in the statement of the issue. Correct. So make sure that you know what your jurisdiction requires. You can almost always refer to the rules for that. So. Let's move on to the uh, statement of the case, statement of the facts. Sometimes these two things are separate. Sometimes, uh, sometimes they're unified. I know the Eighth Circuit about five years ago uh, had these two separate, but then they then actually they, that was a change in the federal appellate rule, so that across was a, a the national country. change. Yeah. Okay. Um, so so let's talk about that. This is the section where you talk about the trial procedure, sentencing procedure, uh, the underlying facts of the case. It's the sentence, the statement of the case, statement of the case procedure, statement of the facts. Um, again, referring to that rule of thumb, you want to include everything that's relevant and nothing more. Uh, sometimes things that look relevant actually aren't. Uh, sometimes things that aren't legally relevant actually are. If your client is particularly uh, a particularly sympathetic client, but that person's characteristics, personality, history doesn't legally matter, maybe that's something that you want to find a way to put in. Uh, judges are human beings and they might, they might respond to that. 
Uh, <clears throat> typically, uh, we've got some rules of thumb up on the board here. Uh, one idea per sentence, one idea per paragraph, um, and each sentence and each paragraph should logically follow from the previous and lead on uh, to the next sentence, the next paragraph. I, this is stuff we learned in writing in junior high school and high school, and it applies in briefs. Uh, your writing should be clear, easy to read. The worst thing, I think, that you can do is produce writing uh, for which the reader has to think about what you mean. The judge might disagree with you ultimately, but he or she should know what you mean. When I uh, have a draft, first or second draft, and, and I give it to my paralegal who's a college graduate but has never been to law school, one of the things I'm asking him or her to do when reading my writing is to say, see how many sentences you can find in here that could be cut into two or three sentences. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes when I write uh, law review articles, I send my mom a copy because she likes that sort of thing. She reads the first couple pages and she says, wow, you're such a good writer. I didn't understand a word of it. <laughs> and I keep trying to tell her that's a bad thing. Uh, and the same thing goes for briefs. You should give your briefs to a paralegal or a spouse or your 18-year-old kid who doesn't care if they can understand what you're saying. You've probably got an effective brief. Another tip is if you really don't have anyone who's interested to share is to read it aloud and when you actually read it aloud and then you find yourself stumbling over the sentences that will tell you when there should be certain breaks too. Mm -hmm. Agreed, agreed. And you can set it aside for a couple days and come back to it and you can read it to some degree uh, like somebody who didn't write it right. and that's well, important. I don't buy the, 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 the 20 words per sentence fetish um, maybe that's self-serving but I definitely agree with there should be a paragraph break visible on every page. Yes, yes absolutely. And I think I took that, uh, I th think I took that tip from you. Uh, but certainly the sentences should be um, shorter rather than longer as a general rule, but they should be clear, organized, one idea per sentence. The theme that I'm hearing um, that Steve is really emphasizing too is everything you write it should be deliberate. You should be doing it for a particular Absolutely. reason. Mm -hmm. So if you're writing a longer sentence, you better have a particular reason why it's a little bit longer. Mm -hmm. It's just being deliberate in your action. That's absolutely right. And if you can explain why you're doing what you're doing, and if it's a good explanation, mm -hmm. yeah. then you've got something. Well, let's look at the big picture, too, on the statement. You wanna... Yeah. Well, um, uh, so as far as the, the, the big picture goes, yeah. um, you want to create a story, ultimately. The, you know, the law is about stories, and you shouldn't just recite what happened at trial, you shouldn't just recite the motions, but you should know all of the facts. You should know them really without thinking about them, ultimately, and put them into one unified story that makes sense, that's compelling. Um, one of the most important things you want to do is acknowledge the facts that are the worst for your case and try to turn them to your favor. And oftentimes, well, frankly, you, you can. How do you do that with the light, you know, considering that the appeal is gonna be viewed with the facts in the light most favorable to the verdict winner, which is almost certainly not our client? Well, I think it's especially important on appeal to use those bad facts to your favor because you've got that, you've got that really bad standard of review. And if you ignore the worst facts, well, you've already lost before you've even started. So if you can turn those bad facts to your favor, you've got a fighting chance. And I just want to emphasize too that it is important when you're drafting a statement of facts to think about the standard of review because the majority of the time you will draft the facts in a light most favorable to the government who prevailed at trial. Mm -hmm. But there are some issues, for example, my jurisdiction where when you have a jury instruction issue, the facts are viewed in light most favorable to the proponent of the instruction. So as the mm -hmm. defense, if you're proffering an instruction that's rejected, you can draft the facts in a light most favorable to your client. And that mm -hmm. certainly will look like a different version of facts than if it was favorable to the government. So you need to take into account your standard of review. And if you've got a constitutional issue, it's going to be reviewed de novo generally. Uh, and so you might slightly change how you draft that statement to suit that. So would you agree that the overall goal is when the judge or law clerk finishes reading the statement of the case, including the statement of facts, they should not hate your client? 
They should be interested. They should be interested in finding a way to help you and want you to win. Yes, a compelling story. Well, yes, of incredible. course, of sure. course, of course. So, a little little trick on when the a, a really bad fact, if you you could draft it so that it says, "Witness so and so, a convicted criminal, testified for the prosecution that mm-hmm. bad fact." Mm-hmm. You don't have to say bad fact is true, even though that would be the facts in the light most favorable to the verdict. Right. It would be. Yep. Not wrong the to say a witness testified to this fact. The assertion of the witness isn't true. The fact that the witness, yeah. who might be unreliable, right. asserted that fact. That's the fact. And the same is true of contrary facts that the jury may have rejected. You could still, if you need them to tell your story, say, so-and-so testified for the defense that X happened. You're not asserting that it is a fact because it's contrary to the verdict, but well, you're telling something which is true if for some reason you need it. Or the defendant testified in his own defense that X, Y, Z, even if it's uh, these are facts that the jury rejected because it's true that the defendant testified and you want the defendant's testif- story, the client almost certainly wants his or her story to be heard, and you probably want that story mm-hmm. to be heard, to be known that the defendant testified. Well, let's build on that when we're talking about how you cite uh, to uh, the record in the statement mm-hmm. of the case, statement of the facts. Uh, certainly, you should cite to the record for everything you write. For every sentence, there should be a citation. Uh, I think we have some difference of opinion as to if you if you have a particular uh, statement that you're going to make that, that that was in the record, uh, if if there's only one record citation for that one witness uh, testified to this particular fact, well, you're going to cite to that that one uh, page in the transcript or the motion or whatever. But what if there are ten different places in the record where that uh, where that fact or that assertion is supported? Uh, personally, uh, if it's a non-controversial fact, the defendant left the party at 2 a.m. If no party is questioning that, if it's really not in doubt, I'm happy just finding one citation in the record to go for that. If it's a controversial fact, however, well, of course you want more citations. And as far as sort of not saying that, well, the defendant did this, but this unreliable witness said the defendant did this, you might find different portions of the record that support that statement more or less or in some different ways. Mm -hmm. So if you use different parts of the record, uh, you can call into question that assertion. And so uh, you want to use citations wisely. Again, have a reason for Mm -hmm. citing to what you cite to. Uh, and some people, I, I think Peter would be part of this. So let's talk about the argument. <laughs> Fair enough. There are a hundred ways to do that, and they're all fine. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's move on to the argument. Uh, typical sections in an argument, uh, issue, uh, make that uh, statement of the issue leading your argument off. Standard of review is the typical section that comes next. The factual procedural posture. Uh, law, argument, uh, sometimes you need to show prejudice, and then finally the conclusion and the relief requested. These are pretty much all the sections that could go into an argument. Sometimes you're not going to have to show prejudice, so you don't need to include that. When you say sections, you don't necessarily mean labeled as such, do you? Or do you? Uh, Not necessarily. If you need to label these as separate sections for clarity, for persuasiveness, then you want to label or for them. tradition or rules, of or course. For tradition or rules, um, but I I wouldn't label my sections that way at all. You okay, know, I would, I'm going to cover all of that. Mm-hmm. I'm going to be sure the the relevant facts are resummarized, that the law is in, discussed and uh, identified. But I'm not going to the law in my mind does not exist separately from the application of the law to the facts when you're writing a brief. I think that's right. I think for sort of beginning attorneys and for law students, they need a, a concrete, clear structure that helps them organize their thoughts. This is what appellate courts are looking for, but I think as you get more advanced and as you get more familiar with your case, you'll see that this structure can be changed a little. Uh, the facts can't be treated separately from the law, and so you can meld those two sections to a degree as appropriate. Um, some jurisdictions might have particular rules requiring a standard of review section. Well, if there's a rule, then you have to put it in. 
but if there's no rule, uh, you can feel free to be flexible, alter this structure, um, as long as you do so deliberately and with a view towards clarity, persuasiveness, organization. And again, the briefs that are distributed with them as materials with this presentation will illustrate that mm -hmm. in, in a variety of ways. Yeah, when I was a starting attorney, I sort of hewed closely to this structure because it was easy, it was comfortable, but I've moved away from that and um, hopefully, for the, hopefully for the better. Well, uh, let's talk about the standard of review. I think, I think a lot of attorneys don't uh, think about it much. Um, perhaps oftentimes because it's usually pretty easy to determine, right? If you're challenging uh, a judge's ruling on the admissibility of evidence or uh, a ruling regarding, um, you know, whether a search or seizure was unconstitutional, the, the standard of review is relatively easy to find. And what I do is I go to Westlaw, or if you have Lexis, you can do that, and you do a search for we review, and within the same sentence, Rule 403 or Fourth Amendment or whatever your issue might be. My the, trick is even simpler. I don't us. write that till the end, and I because. One of the cases I've cited for some substantive point that's related to the argument I'm making is going to mention the, state, the standard of review for sure. arguments of that kind, and sure. I'll just borrow it from that case that I've cited for, for the merits and stick that into my standard of I, review. I actually like to find what I call a defense-friendly case uh -huh. where the standard of review that applies to the issue, especially when it's a difficult standard of review such as abuse of discretion, is to find a case where the court applied that standard recognizing it was a tough standard, but the defendant still won in that case. Oh, that's a wonderful To kind of remind the court that, yeah. yes, this is a tough standard, but look, this can be met, and we're meeting it in this case. Good idea. And oftentimes at oral argument, the judge might ask you, well, have you ever found a case where the defendant won? You can say, absolutely, Your Honor, and it's cited on page three. The other thing that I like to do with the standard of review is to make sure that there's some defense-friendly language in it, especially because a lot of standards of review are unfavorable. So again, abuse of discretion, yes, I might recognize that the issue, the standard of review is an abuse of discretion, but then I'll develop that a little bit further and say, well, any time that there's an error of law, per se an abuse of discretion occurred. I then even further have a case that will say, any time that a trial court is influenced by a mistake in law, an abuse of discretion occurs. Mm -hmm. So I take that standard and I build upon it. Yeah, and so only sometimes is it easy to determine the standard of review and it's one line or two lines. Oftentimes you'll have standards of review that are, that are uh, relatively unsettled. And on the board I have one example that, again, comes from a case I'm working on right now. Uh, it's, it's a highly unsettled standard of review. And so I have a little argumentation in that standard of review section that this is the type of standard of review that the court should adopt. Uh, another, uh, another possible complexity when it comes to standards of review is what Catherine was saying. The court might say, this is our standard of review. It's abuse of discretion. But then there might be some dicta around that, some language that's really helpful. And of course, the prosecution is going to want to boil it down to, well, it's an abuse of discretion and that's it you can usually find language that helps you out a little more. Sufficiency of evidence is another good example of that. Mm -hmm. You know, the standard review for sufficiency of evidence, um, you know, the prosecution version of that is, was there substantial evidence to support the verdict? Right. Mm -hmm. But it's equally true to say, was uh, the evidence at trial sufficient to persuade a reasonable jury beyond a reasonable doubt mm -hmm. that every element of the offense properly interpreted under the law was proved? There's a lot you can build on there. And those two things technically mean the same thing. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, but one, there's a lot more avenues of exploration. And what Steve was saying, too, about when the standard of review is unsettled, that's where I think you can kind of have some fun and give an argument of why it should be de novo. Or don't be afraid to sometimes challenge the standard of review. I had a case before where the issue um, how to deal with the trial court not granting a competency evaluation because it was the day of trial. And the standard is probable cause. Well, there was a competency case directly on point that used an abuse of discretion, but I pointed to all 
The Fourth Amendment area of law where probable cause is always reviewed as a mixed statement of question of fact and law. So I tried to actually make a sub-issue that the standard of review should be this mixed statement mm -hmm. of fact and law rather than abuse of discretion. Mm -hmm. I lost, but it came up during oral argument, which at least made me feel like it was worthy to. And it's not, yeah, the standard there. of review is not always an afterthought. Judges can press you on it. So uh, let, let's talk about the argument itself, the, the law section. So let's move on to the, the law section of the argument, which would typically follow the standard of review. And here you're going to want to set forth the relevant law. And I think when you're proceeding to do the research into that law, it's helpful to put the law into four sections. Uh, the law that's settled and you know, right? The Fourth Amendment prohibits unreasonable searches and seizures. It's relative, I mean, you know that. Uh, law that is settled, but you don't know. Uh, it's out there, but you maybe you're vaguely familiar with it, but you don't really know it. Uh, law that is unsettled, but has clear divergent paths, right? There's a circuit split. Uh, and then fourth, the law that's virtually uncreated. You're in uncharted territory. And uh, understanding sort of where you're at is going to guide your uh, research into the law. Um, if the law is settled and you know the law, your research should be relatively simple. You're going to want to find cases uh, that, that support what you already know so that you can cite them, but also so that you can make sure you're correct because you always want to check. And I'm never, I'm never going to tell a client uh, what the law is unless I've done the research, even if I know it. Um, if the law is settled, but you're not really sure what it is, your research is going to be a little more in depth. You're going to have to be a little more careful, uh, but you're in familiar territory. When there's a circuit split, uh, when you're basically trying to create new law, uh, that's where the real heavy lifting comes in. Um, but wherever you, uh, wherever you're at in terms of the, your your legal research, you're going to want to go to Westlaw. You're going to want to go to Lexis, and you're going to do these these Boolean searches, um, we review within the same uh, within the same sentence, Rule 403 or Fourth Amendment, uh, cell phone, whatever those Boolean searches are, and it pays to really understand uh, how to do good Boolean searches. Uh, the more unsettled or the more uncreated the law is, the more you're going to want to be smart about doing various types of Boolean searches. And I've done searches with two terms in the same sentence, and I've done searches with five different terms in the entire case. And of course, you're going to get uh, fewer responses, you're going to get more responses. And uh, So Steve, are you saying that in, you know, in your experience, and, and maybe even having tested this thesis, that using the natural language searching functions of Westlaw or Lexis, you don't find to be as successful and productive in refinding what you're looking for? Personally, I've never been comfortable with it. Uh, I think it's just as reliable if that's if you're if you're comfortable with the natural language search. But I've always been uh, more comfortable with doing Boolean searches. But I, I think if you do multiple natural language searches, uh, you'll get to the same you'll get to the same uh, result. I don't know. What do you think? I've. I've done both. Sometimes I'll take an issue and I'll do both a natural language and a Boolean search to see if I get anything different to kind of to compare. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the other thing that I wanted to add, though, is I know that there's some practitioners out there who might not have Westlaw or Lexis at their disposal. And most jurisdictions, you still need to find some sort of search engine to search for cases. I know that there's, by virtually being a member of a bar association, you might have access to a particular um, research database, or at the very least, courts generally post their opinions online, and sometimes you can do a search function um, there. So I do just want to recognize that not right. everyone has the resource of Westlaw mm -hmm. or Lexis, but there are other avenues for you to... Mm -hmm. To well, do proper the county research. law library may have a free access right. or, or membership that's quite affordable that gives you access. Right. There are indirect ways. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. Some law schools might have access. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it, hopefully if you do have access, mm -hmm. uh, you want to do those Boolean searches. And as a general rule, depending on how many uh, search results you get, it might tell you uh, whether you need to 
focus you're searching or make it more broad. As a, rel as, as a general guideline, uh, and it's on the board here, if, if less than 50 cases are returned, your search might be too narrow or the law might be unsettled. Not, not saying that's 100%, but in my experience, um, if you get less than 50 cases, there's something going on that you want to figure out. If you get more than 200 cases, your search might be too broad or the law might be complex. Um, so if I'm doing a search, if I get between that 50 and 200 case uh, uh, focus, uh, then I think typically that's going to be an efficient search. Not 100% not of the time, but I think as you, as you do this, as you do more research on Westlaw or Lexis or any other service if you have access to it, uh, you'll get a real sense for if a lot of cases are returned, what that means, and if you get a few cases returned, what that means. Um, but it pays to really become very familiar with how to do these searches. And um, um, you know, once you get a certain number of cases returned, if you get say 150 cases, 200 cases, typically what I do is I go through them and uh, I open them up and maybe I look at the head notes, maybe I look at the syllabus, maybe I read a portion of the case. If it looks highly relevant, I'll flag it, I'll download it, and if I get, say, 100 cases returned, I'll probably download, at the very least, 20, if not all of the cases, just so I can read through them and make sure I know what the law is. So our, I use Westlaw, so I, I could be asking too narrow a question here, but mm -hmm. um, in Westlaw, you can tell Westlaw how to organize the results. Um, do you want them organized? First, do you want to eliminate non-precedential opinions or do you want to include them? Mm -hmm. Do you want to include trial level opinions or do you want to exclude them? Mm -hmm. And then do you want, what order do you want them in? Do you want the artificial intelligence of the company right. to organize them in terms of relevance, as they call it on Westlaw, or do you want to specify, I want the decisions of the highest court of the jurisdiction to be listed first, and I want the most recent ones to be listed first among those, mm -hmm. which is personally what I do, because I don't trust their artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. I have enough trouble with my own natural intelligence, mm -hmm. <laughs> not to rely on uh, any artificial intelligence, and I, I, f I am have been extremely dissatisfied with the Westlaw artificial intelligence idea of what are the most relevant mm -hmm. results when I ask for them to be displayed that way. When Westlaw... I wonder, do you have similar experience? Right, or? well, when Westlaw created the relevance system, I think about five years ago, mm -hmm. there, was, there was an uproar that they were sort of taking over legal research. And uh, I, I, I disagreed with that, both because you can select how you have the cases returned, and I've worked with the relevance system I think for me, typically it works, although I don't rely on it solely. I, I look through all of the cases that are returned. And oftentimes there are cases that fall, that, that Westlaw says are really not relevant, but in fact they are. But as a general rule, I think it's a reasonably helpful way for, uh, for Westlaw to organize the cases. And I bet it has something to do with how narrow you framed your search. Absolutely. I, I use Lexis and mm -hmm. There's a similar way to search to or limit your search, relevance or by court or by date. And I do the same thing that seems like you both do with Westlaw is kind of do a combination of relevant searches, but also do by date. So I don't think it's, I think both in Lexus and Westlaw, mm -hmm. there's a similar feature. I, I do so. find recent non-precedential opinions to be a wonderful source for finding out what the judges of that court mm -hmm. think are the leading precedential mm -hmm. decisions mm -hmm. on this issue. And one thing to keep in mind, which we haven't talked about what we should, uh, how does your jurisdiction treat unpublished cases uh, if you have memoranda of decision in some state courts? Um, you know, you want to think about that. Uh, some are you're essentially prohibited from, from citing. Others you can cite but for certain purposes. So you just want to know the rules of your particular jurisdiction regarding what cases are important to cite. And you don't want to forget, even if you're in state court, look at U.S. Supreme Court cases. Look at federal cases. You might see, you might see a federal constitutional issue uh, that's relevant. So um, in terms of uh, if you get to the, the, the law section and you're having a hard time, well, a couple things you could consider. You don't fully understand the facts of your case. 
you don't fully understand the issue or you didn't draft it well, uh, or you don't know the law yet, or it's highly unsettled. Uh, doesn't mean you're a bad attorney. It just means that you start with the facts of the case. Um, and as we talked about uh, during Peter's session, you look at the record and you think about, well, what do I not like? How did it turn bad for my client? And you come up with that list of potential issues. Some of those issues are clear. You know, the judge said that the cell phone was searched in a constitutional manner. Well, that's a relatively easy issue to spot. Other issues are a little tricky. And so personally, I adopt this, I don't like it standard. If, if something happened at trial that I don't like for my client, I put it on the issue. But you have to translate that into a legally cognizable issue that the court's gonna, that the court's gonna take on. If you haven't done that, it's gonna be really difficult to research the law on that issue. So you start with the facts, you think about what the issues might be, and as you clarify those two things, finding the law becomes, well, I don't wanna say yeah. easy, but oftentimes it can be relatively easy, put it that way. The sample, one of the two sample briefs that I supplied, one versus government versus Rice, US versus Rice, has an issue like that which people might wanna look at where mm -hmm. it was, uh, it was a cut, it's a cutting edge electronic search mm -hmm. issue with an ambiguity in how Title III is, the wiretap law is written, very much confused and difficult yes. finding the path to the issue, yes. which was life or death to the client's uh, appeal. Right, mm -hmm. absolutely. So um, as we get to the end of the brief, we're talking about that relief requested section and possibly the conclusion. The the relief requested section, I, I think, is, is it's very important. Uh, you want to make sure that the court knows exactly what you want. Be very clear with that. Uh, that's going to go somewhere, you know, very early in your brief, but it's also going to go in that relief requested section. Uh, and then, typically, after that section, you might have an overall conclusion for the entirety of your brief. Uh, the conclusion section, in my experience, is some of the, is one of the more difficult sections to draft because you don't want to repeat yourself. Uh, so, so what do you do with it? And I think for my for my part, the conclusion section is that thirty second elevator speech. If the judge or the clerk uh, remembers something from my brief, it should be that conclusion section where I not only sum up what I want the court to do, but maybe I add a hook. Maybe I remind the court of something particularly salient or compelling so that the clerk or the judge can go on his or her day thinking about just that that conclusion. You know that it's very interesting. I have never done that and I think it's a really interesting idea. I'm going to look at maybe doing that including a bit of summary mm -hmm. and highlighting in that conclusion rather than using the conclusion in perhaps the more traditional and dry way mm -hmm. of just making clear whether you think that if they rule in your favor, this would entitle you to mm -hmm. a remand for a hearing right. or a new trial or a dismissal or an acquittal. Yeah. And, and which of those is it and why? And that, mm -hmm. which would kind of is the conventional yeah. way, which I've typically done, but I'm going to definitely look at that idea. Yeah. I've done it your way uh, on occasion. Uh, it just, it, it's, I think it really depends what's going to be clearest, most compelling, and so forth. Uh, finally, you have the option to file a reply brief. It's, it's typically going to be relatively short because all you're doing is responding to issues that were arising in the government's brief. Uh, you can't raise new issues in your reply brief uh, unless those issues are raised as the result of what the government raised. Um, you're surprised by something in the government's brief that says you didn't preserve an issue mm -hmm. which you had kind of taken for granted. You can absolutely you may, talk yeah, about that. You may not have you to should. pursue that. Yeah. You should talk about yeah. it. Um, generally, um, I, I think most attorneys say you should always file a reply brief. Uh, in, in the empirical study that I and my colleague did, there, there typically was a positive correlation between filing a reply brief um, and oral argument and outcome success. It's weakly correlated, uh, but there is a statistically significant positive correlation. So my suggestion would be that in virtually every case, you want to file a reply brief. I've, I've heard some jurors say that they actually read the reply brief first. Mm. And the reason that they read it first, which I've taken to heart now in crafting the reply brief, is because 
the reply brief is going to address the hardest question in your case. You've got to put in your opening brief your best foot forward. The government has been able to put their best foot forward. And that reply brief is dealing with the toughest issues or the toughest questions raised by the government. And your response can be crucial to why you still should win mm -hmm. the case. Um, so I, I keep that in mind when I do yeah. a reply and, brief. And just a, a little, maybe it seems simple tip, but just because I've seen people do this badly reading other people's briefs sometimes, the reply brief should, should say with respect to each issue, we said this, they say that, that's not persuasive because. That's mm -hmm. the mental structure of a mm -hmm. reply brief. Don't start with, they say this. Right. Mm -hmm. Start with, we say this. You want to own the they argument. say that. Absolutely. And they don't win because. Yeah. And even if it's the, no more than what I'm about to say, I would still include it in my reply brief. We say this, they say that, nothing in the government's brief was, uh, was uh, there is nothing in the government's brief that wasn't fully anticipated in our opening brief, and therefore there is no cause for reply, mm -hmm. and that's what my reply says. Mm -hmm. So sometimes, <laughs> when it's true, <laughs> when it's true, <laughs> or when I have no idea what to say. <laughs> <laughs> well, so let's move on to oral argument. Uh, oftentimes, in in federal court, anyway, typically you're going to get twelve to fifteen minutes, at, at least in the Eighth Circuit, uh, maybe. But it's. But it it's you know, going to vary. In state courts, often it's half an hour, and sometimes it's different. For yeah. writ argument, we get 10 minutes. For a merit argument, each side gets 15. Okay. Uh -huh. All right. Yeah. And, but you have courts like the Second Circuit, which gives or oral argument to almost everybody, and then tells you you have five minutes. Mm -hmm. And what they mean is you have a right to five minutes, and we'll let you know at about four and a half minutes how you're doing, because that might turn into 20. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It can be, you know, in any event, it's a relatively short period of time given how much you've worked on this brief. And uh, I, I love all our oral argument uh, because I consider myself to be Neo from the Matrix when I'm an oral argument. And, and pick your pop culture reference, uh, whoever you think is most compelling. Um, but I think Neo is a great example for a lot of things in the law. Oral argument is like entering the Matrix as Neo. You know your facts. You know your law, you know your argument inside and out. Just like Neo knew Kung Fu, he didn't even have to think about it. You know your argument. Uh, you use everything in your environment. You wanna get to that courtroom ahead of time if you can. You wanna be familiar with the lectern. Uh, maybe there's some air conditioning noise that you you're gonna have to consider. Or you sit on the right. Sit this on actually, the left. You sit on the right. This varies by court. Yeah. You may be used to sitting on the left and now you're Arguing in another court, and the appellant is supposed to be on the right. Assuming Absolutely. you're the appellant, right? Absolutely. Or you may be the appellee this time for the once in a hundred arguments when that's true. And Absolutely. You want to go to that other side? Absolutely. Yeah. So you want to be comfortable with your environment. Uh, you want to know everything about your case, and you want to also know everything about what the judges are going to throw at you, what questions they're going to ask. Uh, if you've done your preparation, you can pretty much anticipate what the judges will ask you. Now, sometimes you can't. And just like Neo in the Matrix, he was resilient. He was able to respond to unpredicted events because he was prepared, because he knew what he was doing. He was comfortable in his environment. He used it to his advantage. Um, he had a really amazing self-awareness. He knew he was the one or he was confident that he wasn't. You want to assess your own psychological state. Are you naturally anxious? Did you get a good night's sleep? Do you have, you know, have you had too much coffee? Um, that psychological state is going to affect your oral argument. You can use your anxiety to your advantage, but only if you recognize it. Um, sometimes you, if you're a, just an intrinsically calm, same person, uh, you can use that to your advantage, uh, but maybe you need to step it up a little. You just need to have self-awareness when you go into that courtroom. You just want to be at your best. And if you're not, if you've had a bad day the day before, if something bad happened, you need to acknowledge that and figure out a way to manage it. Not everybody is always 100% and that's fine, uh, but you need to be aware of, of what you're bringing into the courtroom. Um, so. Uh, 
Neo responded to his environment, but he had a predetermined goal. He knew where he wanted to get, and instead of letting the environment shape that goal, he used the environment to get to that goal. So when you go into the courtroom, you filed your brief, you have your relief requested, you have your arguments, you have a goal. You want the court to order a new trial. You want the court to vacate the sentence or whatever. Uh, some judges are very sympathetic and they will help you along. Use them. Some judges don't really know much about your case. Other judges are antagonistic. Use what they ask you. Use their skepticism or whatever it is they bring to the table to get to that goal. Right? Manage your environment. Control your environment to the extent you can to get to that goal. Uh, he was efficient. Neo was efficient. Um, he did only what he had to do to get to that goal. You don't want to be wordy. You have five minutes. You have maybe half an hour. Even half an hour goes by quickly. You want to have rehearsed your statements, uh, rehearsed answers to, your, uh, to the questions you, you think the court will ask. You want to be succinct. Uh, you want to be clear and you don't want to go on and on. It's, it's going to waste time, it's going to be less than clear, and uh, you're going to spend a lot of time thinking at the lectern about how to say what you want to say. But if you thought about it up front, you'll have stock answers that nevertheless can sound genuine. And um, when, you, when, you, when you hear a really good piece of oral advocacy in the Supreme Court, you might think, wow, how did they think of that on the spot? Well, they did. They mooted and mooted and mooted. They ran a script. They have what they want to say, but they also know how they're going to respond to the judge's questions. Well, you mentioned moot, so how likely are you to have done a moot court? For Pretty, likely. Pretty likely. Um, I'm a professor and I've historically used my students. Uh, they kind of act as judges and the students show up. And they're very good, actually. Um, mm -hmm. So if you can moot, I highly recommend it. We, we moot in our system. Sometimes you'll be able to moot within an office, but we've also organized regional events where um, the different offices who have an upcoming argument on the docket will come together so you get totally different perspectives mm -hmm. and get a sense of questions. Mm -hmm. right. so in, in my experience, I've done you know well over 200 uh, appellate arguments now in, in my career. I don't moot all my cases, but I still moot some of my arguments. If I mm -hmm. think that I really am not sure what the questions are going to be, mm -hmm. or whether it's tricky or cutting edge or something, mm -hmm. I will recruit uh, colleagues, if possible, often from the appellate division of the public defender's office, mm -hmm. who have re similar cases and are interested in exploring it with me, yeah. to give me half an hour to mm -hmm. uh, or an hour some to, cases. to moot a case. Because I'm in a tiny office. I mean, I don't have. Co I only have one associate. Uh, in my office, same person I've worked with for over 30 years, mm -hmm. um, and um, so I have to set something up if I want to do that. Right. But it is still it's such a valuable tool. Absolutely, and in, in the more complex cases, the trickier ones, mm -hmm. uh, you want to move. Some simpler cases, perhaps mm -hmm. you can get away without it. But if it's your first case, even if it is simple, that's also another great reason oh, to move. Yes. If it's your first two, three, four cases, yes. you should move. Find somebody. Uh, get family members, get friends, get anybody you can. Uh, a couple other sort of points that you really want to keep in mind, some more basics when it comes to oral argument. Uh, when you come to the lectern, chances are good you're going to have the opportunity only to look at one piece of paper. You're not going to bring up a big binder. If you do, you'll never look at it. And if you do look at it, you're, you're probably already lost. Uh, personally, I have one piece of paper. Some people bring big binders even though they don't get a chance to look at them. It makes them feel secure. If it makes you feel secure, bring yeah. it. Absolutely. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, but as far as materials you're actually going to access, yes. you're not going to have time to access a lot. Um, uh, dress conservatively. Uh, suppose that goes without saying, but I was in, uh, in court in the Eighth Circuit a couple months ago and the attorney before me was wearing jeans, uh, which <laughs> Kind of shocked, but it happens. Um, if you can reserve time for rebuttal, that's I think I think typically something you need to do beforehand. Um, Again, that's going to vary by the culture and rules of the court. You may have to in some courts you take care of that with the ba the you know bailiff or clerk, clerk uh, yep. timekeeper beforehand. In some places you 
need to do it orally with the presiding judge at the beginning of your argument. Other places, you have to do both. Mm -hmm. And the if third you, circuit, you reserve it with the clerk, and you still have to say, "I'd like to reserve three minutes for rebuttal." And in some cases, even if you reserve it uh, during your opening argument, you need to cut off questioning, yes. or else right. the judges will keep going, and you'll eat up your rebuttal time. Uh, so it, it's something uh, something to think opening about. Line. What do you think? Do you have a standard opening line? I don't have a standard opening line. Um, uh, no, I don't have a standard opening line. It varies. Can I tell you what I say every time? Please. May it please the court. My name is Peter Goldberger, and it is my privilege today to represent name of client who was the defendant below and is the appellant here. Mm -hmm. I'd like to reserve two minutes for rebuttal. Mm -hmm. And then one sentence I've memorized that it summarizes the case if I never get to say anything else of my own volition. That's a pretty good opening line. That, that pretty much sums it up. Uh, finally, regarding judges' questions, if you're talking and they speak up, uh, you need to stop speaking and listen. Uh, if they ask you a question for which there is an easy yes or no answer, well, you answer yes or no. Uh, if you don't know, you say you don't know. If, you, if it's maybe and you need to expound upon it, you can say maybe and expound upon it. It's okay to think for a moment about your answer. Um, I recall uh, when Bill Clinton was running in 1992, he had these debates and the moderator would ask him a question and he would sit there for like 10 seconds and supposedly think about his answer. Well, he already knew the answer, but he was projecting a sense of gravitas and it, it worked. Um, when it comes to oral argument, I don't think you want to fake it and, pre and project a sense of gravitas. But if you really do need to think for a second or two about your answer, that's perfectly appropriate. And in my experience, the judges will, will wait for you. Uh, but if they're talking, you shouldn't. Uh, if they interrupt you, that's OK, but you should never interrupt them. And, and you know, simply, simply be respectful, answer their questions. Uh, this has always surprised me, but some judges will ask, uh, ask you hypothetical questions. Well, what about this situation? And it's always surprised me that some attorneys will say, well, that's not my case. Well, the judges know it's not your case. They're asking you a hypothetical. So you should do your best to answer the hypothetical in a way that works best for your client. Um, and Having quickly tried to figure out what they think is the relevance of this hypothetical. Exactly. Because somebody thinks there is a relevance exactly. to it. Exactly. And by the way, in, in prepping for oral argument, these hypotheticals are some things that you can think about and you can predict the judges will ask you. So it's not like hypotheticals have to come out of, of left field. And, uh, an, and another tip that if you don't know the answer to a question or a hypothetical, be honest and say that, but think about it when the government's arguing their case and you can always come back to that during rebuttal. Mm -hmm. Sometimes so that way you'll have a little bit more time or you'll be able to flip through the record. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. or your notes and it'll come to you and you can go back to it at There that are point. two kinds of I don't know. There's I don't know but it's in my brief and I know where to find it. Right. And there's I don't know because I never thought of that before. Right. And obviously you would respond to those two problems in different ways. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, uh, that, that really is what we have in terms of brief writing and oral argument. Uh, you have a lot of time to, to write the brief and a lot of time uh, to, to prep for oral argument. Uh, these are focused, isolated instances, uh, quite unlike trial practice. And uh, you can do a lot to uh, draft a really good brief and participate in a really effective oral argument.